Hey, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have Chris Nasky on with me today. Chris is an eighth degree black belt, former national champion, speaker, author, coach, and master of the champion's mindset. Uh, my son McMillan went through Taekwondo for years, got his black belt, a lot of tears and hard work and years of effort, and he worked his way all the way up to getting his black belt. So Chris and I connected on that level as we went through this. But Chris is an amazing speaker, and he helps, and he works with organizations and individuals to inspire them and their teams to reach higher levels, leadership, teamwork, passion, and breakthrough results in both their personal and professional lives by adopting a champion's mindset. Chris is on the podcast. This gentleman is is very inspirational. We get to talk a little bit about his past, about the journey through the all the different levels of belts. Chris would be an excellent speaker for your next event. All the details are in the show notes. Uh, this is my conversation with Chris Natsky here on Living the Next Chapter. And so, because when I was watching her do her technique, she looked like she had enough power or whatever, but she kept hitting the board off center. And when you do that, it's almost always not going to break. So anyway, now I have the board. All, everyone on the entire room has broken except for her. And she bounces off it once. She bounces it off, bounces off it twice. And so I lean over to her and I say quietly, I'll tell you what, I am here all week at, the, at this conference. I'm going to give you one more opportunity on this. And if it doesn't break now, we'll just, we'll, we'll, you and I will just step off to the side tomorrow. We'll make it happen. So I could see that she now really locked in her focus and her concentration. And she got into her breath. She took her practice and crack, she broke right through it. And the crowd went nuts. I mean, 60 people on their feet, standing ovation. She jumped into my arms and gave me a hug. When, when she came away from me, I could see tears streaming down her, her face. And it was just such a testament in my mind of the power of perseverance and having that experience and also how watching people struggle then breakthrough can inspire all of us, right? Because if everything's perfect in our world, yeah, okay, we kind of like that. But when we go through those tough times and then break through, we become a real inspiration for other people as well. So one of my favorite memories of all time. Okay, everyone, welcome to the podcast. I have a guest with me today who I met through a past guest, and I love connecting with people and making these great connections. And... uh Chris is here with me today, and if anything breaks out, if anything really bad happens, if this goes sideways, Chris has got lots of black belt training. He can protect all of us. We're all in safe hands today. So I feel very comforted knowing that, that again, if somebody gets in here and things go crazy, <laughs> Chris is going to just take care of it. So Chris, welcome to the podcast. So glad to have you here. How are you? Great to be here, Dave. I'm doing awesome. How about you? Awesome. And just on, if you're watching the video, just off to Chris's behind Chris, there are some amazing pictures from your background, Chris. Um, my son, I talked to you, my son took Taekwondo for, I don't know, nine or 10 years, worked his way to black belt. And he learned so much in the process of going through that. And, um, great admiration for people who follow through. And I remember every time I took my son to class, right across the doorway was, I'm working towards my black belt. Yeah. It was like they're just a thing every day you saw, right? So your background, Chris, can you give us a little uh, indication of some of the things that you've accomplished in your in your past? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks, Dave. So I'm a, I'm an eighth degree black belt. I've been training in uh, Taekwondo and martial arts. Um, this is my 50th year. Wow. So I started in 1973. I'd like to say I started in the womb. That way it makes me feel a little bit, sound a little bit younger, but uh, I started my martial art training back in 73. Uh, and in 1999, I was the United States national Taekwondo champion, heavyweight division, uh, owned a martial arts school uh, here in the Denver area for 17 years called the Family Martial Arts Center, which at its peak had over 500 students at one location. And then I um, 
I released that school. I sold it. Uh, now one of my students owns it back uh, about 10 years ago. So I've been focusing for the last 10 years on um, motivational speaking. Um, I also do a board breaking experience workshop for corporations. Um, and I do life leadership coaching and I'm an author. So I'm still very, very much involved in the three schools that we have here in Denver, uh, but have kind of shifted my focus. And in my speaking and coaching, I use martial arts as my basis and my metaphor for helping people have breakthroughs in their life and business. I love it. Okay. So Chris, from your perspective for a parent with children, and they're looking for something to get their children into and involved in, can you just speak to martial arts as far as what children can learn and the kind of disciplines and things that they can bring home with them from Absolutely. the kind of teaching? Yeah, I mean, I'm obviously a little bit biased, Dave, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's probably one of the best things you've already spoken to it about with, with your son. I think it's probably one of the best things you can have your children do. Um, you know, we live in a world with a lot of choices that people can make. There's a lot of distractions. There's a lot of challenges, as we always have. You know, all generations have those. And what martial arts does, I believe, is through the practice of martial arts, and of course, there's a very physical component of it, people learn to feel comfortable with, number one, with their bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And when I believe when we feel comfortable with our bodies, we have a, a tendency to feel more confident about ourselves. There's also an inherent... Um, basis of discipline that's taught, focus, concentration. And what I also love is the element of respect that people will learn through that experience. And so, you know, one of the things that really came present for me when I owned the schools is I realized I was doing as much coaching of my students, particularly the young ones, as I was teaching martial arts because parents were viewing me I, w I found out I was the backup plan at home, right? So if uh, if things weren't going well, hey, if, if you don't straighten that up, you're going to go have to talk with Master Natsuki about that, right? Mm -hmm. And so that became, but I'll tell you what, it's something I absolutely loved because I knew that of all the students that I've trained, and you know, it's been tens of thousands throughout the years, and I've, I have about 15, 1600 students to date that have gotten their black belt with me. And I've realized that not all of them are going to be training in martial arts their whole life from a physical standpoint. But my hope is, is that the lessons that they learned in martial arts will last them a lifetime. And if they are actually continuing to utilize those skills, then I did my job. The one thing that I that I remember the most was watching my son go through all of his col colored belts. And when it came time to breaking that board, mm -hmm. like we're talking my son would be like, six seven years of age in the early stages and that board would come out and i could see on him him struggle with confidence to push through and see and do something that seemed impossible in the moment for him to break that board but you could not progress you could do the perfect boom says you can do everything perfect mm -hmm. everything right on the nose excellent but that last step yeah. was always that last step and he was always nervous and they were patient with him. They gave him encouragement and they made him feel and, and, and identify how he could do it. And they, everyone cheered mm -hmm. when he would break exactly. through these boards. And now you shared a story with me previously where something similar to that happened in a coaching session and teaching session for you. Can we talk about that? Because I yeah, think absolutely. Powerful. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, I believe the story that we talked about was doing uh, a board breaking experience here in Denver, and uh, it's interesting. You say, you know, with kids about having that breakthrough, they you see the confidence. The same thing happens with adults. <laughs> it, okay. it, there is no difference, and. Excuse me. I always like to say we're nothing but big kids anyway, right? Mm -hmm. So this particular story that I shared with you, it had to do with a board breaking experience that I was doing here at a conference in Denver. And there were about 60 people in the board breaking workshop. And we had gone through and, and 59 of those people had broken their boards. But we had one person that was left over. She still had not broken her board. And at that point in time, I had taken over holding it for her to help her go through. And at this point, she had taken like, she'd probably hit that board 12 times, 10, 12 times. And 
I didn't know at the time, but I found out later that she had multiple sclerosis. Wow. And so, because when I was watching her do her technique, she looked like she had enough power or whatever, but she kept hitting the board off center. And when you do that, it's almost always not going to break. Mm -hmm. So anyway, now I have the board. All, everyone on the entire room has broken except for her. And she bounces off at once. She bounces it off, bounces off it twice. And so I lean over to her and I say quietly, I'll tell you what, I am here all week at the at this conference. I'm going to give you one more opportunity on this. And if it doesn't break now, we'll just we'll, we'll you and I will just step off to the side tomorrow. We'll make it happen. So I could see that she now really locked in her focus and her concentration. And she got into her breath. She took her practice and crack. She broke right through it and the crowd went nuts. I mean, mm. 60 people on their feet, standing ovation. She jumped into my arms and gave me a hug. When, when she came away from me, I could see tears streaming down her, her face. And it was just such a testament in my mind of the power of perseverance mm. and having that experience and also how watching people struggle then break through can inspire all of us, right? right? Because if everything's perfect in our world, yeah, okay, we kind of like that. But when we go through those tough times and then break through, we become a real inspiration for other people as well. So one of my favorite memories of all time. Mm, I love that. And I love the visual component. I love the community aspect of what happened there and that everyone was all cheering and all part of this process, right? Right. That's that's an exciting moment, and that's something that I think <clears throat> not just not just that one person would remember. But I think right. the whole room would remember. The whole, that moment, whole right? new, and I've had that happen on a number of occasions. I had another event that I did down in Dallas back in 2019, and then they had me come up post COVID to do it in 22. And I was at my table before the event with my books and whatever, and I saw this lady lock eyes with me, and she started walking toward me. And she looked familiar, but I couldn't place her. And she looked at me and she said, do you remember me? And then all of a sudden it hit me. She was the woman back three years previously who was just like the lady I just explained. She mm. couldn't get the board and finally she did. And the room, of course, went nuts. And she said, I want you to know how powerful that experience was for me. And it's still with me today. So, yeah. It's 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 a reason I, I do the work, right? It's 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 because knowing that I can at least have a small part in making a difference in someone's life and then carry it forward really inspires me. So at what point did you realize that you could take what you were doing with your students <clears throat> in in the setting of teaching the martial arts and then take this into the business world and into the world to help people? How do you how do you come up with that bridge between the two? Well, there, there, there's two two answers to that. The, in terms of my keynote speaking, what I where I really became adept at speaking was going out in the community and promoting my school. Okay. So I would be out and just you know, any I used to tease if you could fog a mirror, I was going to tell you about my school. Okay, so <laughs> that's how I built it, and I did a lot of that in grade schools, you know, nice. primary schools, middle schools, etc. And then people started saying, you know, you're pretty good at this. Would you come and speak at this event? Come and speak at that event. And so it kind of just grew from there in terms of my keynote. And um, it was actually based off a essay that I had written when I tested for my seventh degree black belt called The Seven Qualities of Black Belt Excellence. And at the time, a friend of mine said, well, you know what? That's your book. And that's your keynote. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the the light bulbs went off and I'm like, oh. so that's how that started. But the board breaking experience was interesting because I have a very good friend of mine who's a fellow coach here in Denver that multiple times a year, he would run what he called a business breakthrough boot camp. So he would bring entrepreneurs in for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three day workshop to help them, you know, get their minds right. And then also be able to build their businesses. And he reached out to me when he changed the name to business to business breakthrough boot camp. And we met and he said, hey, could you do a board breaking experience? And I said, yeah, I, I guess I could do that. So I put it together and it actually went quite well. We had 50 or 60 people at that one that did it as well. But after that event, people or during, you know, right after the board breaking experience, a bunch of people came up to me and said, this has been fabulous. So is this what you do? You travel the country and you <laughs> do this board breaking experience with corporations? And I, hmm. 
I paused and I said, yeah, I think that's a good plan. I do so now. That, yeah. 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 That's yeah. kind of how that came about. <laughs> kind of by accident. I love it. Okay. So you, you arrive at, at a, a, a place to do your, your talk. You're going to speak to a group of people. Tell me a little bit about your preparation for this, because I know in, in martial arts, there's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of practice and understanding. And, you know, just when you come to, to do your, your classes, there's a lot of work that goes behind those. Tell me about how you prepare to get in front of people and share your message. Yeah, well, such a great question. And thanks. I appreciate you asking it. I think that sometimes um, people see speakers and they go, man, I want to do that. Yeah, That guy, he, he goes up there, he speaks for 45 minutes an hour and he's done. That's all he's got to do. <laughs> and they don't realize how many of the hours in advance the right. preparation comes. I think it's what's really interesting for me is the same tools that I developed in martial arts for preparing for rank testings, yeah. workouts, and competition from a visualization standpoint are the exact same tools that I use when I prepare for a talk. So if I if someone hired me to come in and speak, the first thing I would do when I'm speaking with the event planner or the, whoever is hiring me is I try to get a really good idea of the audience that I'm going to be speaking to. Good. You know, who are they demographically? What are their challenges? What are the hot buttons? What's the terminology that they use? So I do a lot of in-depth studying on that. And then I convey my message to meet the needs. Like one of the questions I'll ask is, if there's one thing that you want your folks to take away from my talk, what would it be? And I make sure that I tailor it that way. But then what I do in the weeks and days in advance I do a tremendous amount of visualization. So I literally visualize myself on stage, seeing the crowd, delivering my talk, seeing them laugh at my jokes and mm -hmm. positively interacting with them, et cetera. So by the time I get up on stage, Dave, I've already experienced it several times. Wow. And it's the exact same thing I would do before I'd get in the ring. Mm -hmm. I visualize the techniques I wanted to use. I visualize what would happen if I got scored on and how I would rebound from it. All those things were rehearsed. So same same thing I did for decades in martial arts is what I do now uh, when I prepare for a talk. And that sounds very familiar to go back to the board breaking. Yeah. That's what they would say to my son is don't hit the board. Go hit through the board. That's right. 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 Well, one of the tenants, I have three tenants that I, I teach uh, during the board breaking experience. Number one is the uh, the importance of a solid foundation. And so I talk about from a martial arts standpoint, it's our legs, it's our hips, et cetera. But what are the foundational practices that you have in life? Mm. What are you doing each and every day? What are the, what's your morning routine like, et cetera, et cetera. The second element is the power of our voice. So you've seen your right. son do this. Yes. You yes. do in martial arts, we do the key up, the power yeah. yell. Yeah. But I'm saying, what are the things you're saying to yourself in your mind? Mm -hmm. And also, what are you speaking? And then the final tenant is, Moving through the obstacle, not to the obstacle. Mm -hmm. Right. As many of us in life, we, we're struggling. We have a goal. We get right up to it and then we get distracted. Life happens and then we fall off. And it's the, it's about seeing yourself moving through that obstacle. That's where the power exists. And that's a great, those three points are amazing for a new author as well. Mm -hmm. As they're approaching writing a book and doing this, putting themselves out there. And trying something new. That's right. I love that. That's I'm definitely going to have to rewind that and listen to that again because I think. Well, and you know, from an author it. standpoint, you know, I work with people who are want to, you know, they want to be speakers and authors, et cetera. And what I always tell them is one of the greatest lessons I got when I wrote my first book, my first of two books, is um, there's a, a great book called The War of Art by mm -hmm. a man named Stephen Pressfield. And it's not the art of war. It's the war of art. He's the person who wrote the screenplay for The Legend of Bagger Vance. It was the golfing movie with Will yeah. Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he talks about the aspect of resistance for authors, right? And he says, if it's writing is about being able to move through the discomfort of the resistance. And he, he tells this story about this very famous author whose name is escaping me right now. Who somebody meets him at a cocktail party and says, oh, sir, I love your work. You're so amazing. I've always heard that writers only write when they're inspired. 
is that how you write? And the gentleman pauses for a moment. And he says, you know, I do only write when I'm inspired. It just so happens, though, I get inspired every day at 9 a.m. And so mm. the idea was, is mm. that he allowed his practice of being proactive of writing to bring the inspiration rather than waiting for the inspiration to write. And that's how he became so prolific. And that's what I did. And the other thing I did from a visualization standpoint because I learned this from one of my favorite authors and speakers, Wayne Dyer, is I took a book that was about the size that I wanted to write, the same okay. number of pages. Yeah. And I designed a very, a very crude design, but I designed it nonetheless, a jacket cover for that book. And I wrapped my title of my book and my jacket cover around that book. And every day I would write, I would place it in front of me. Wow. So I was writing from a place of it already being completed. So there, okay. So I, I this is, seems a really odd segue to go to this spot. But when when you are running from something, okay, follow me for a second. You're running from something. You have a bag with you, and you come to a fence. You have two choices: you can climb over the fence and try to grab your bag, or you can throw the bag over the fence and then follow the bag. That's what I'm getting a sense from you: is you get to an obstacle, you take that thing, your book. And you throw it ahead of you, That's and right. then you you catch up to it, right? Because right? we're much more. I believe we're much more powerful running to something than running away from something. Okay, I love that. Right? Yeah. And I mean, it's the it's this whole metaphor with the board. We're moving through it. Yes. Right. We're not running away from it, and and you know, life is filled with challenges, and all of them make us uncomfortable. I still get uncomfortable with challenges every day. Right. You know, even it just it's just part of life, and I think. When we, that's part of having a black belt attitude, I believe, which is knowing that challenges are a reoccurring part of life and getting to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. When you're in, when you're in a martial art class and your muscles ache and you're like, oh, why did I come here today? Mm -hmm. Then you start to lean into your workout and then you find out, man, after a while, I start to feel really good. And when you're done, it's like, well, that's one of the best trainings I've ever had. It didn't, you know, like I had a coach tell me one time, he said, Chris, what does feeling like it have anything to do with it? You know, I, I, I feel like it today or I don't feel like it today. Mm -hmm. He said, get into where you're committed to making something happen and move despite your feeling. And chances are, as you get moving, you're going to get really into it. You're going to start to feel good about it. But if we relied on how we feel about things, we'd never get anything done and we never grow. Yeah. And back to your quote. 9 a.m. doesn't doesn't care if you feel it or not. That's nine, right. 9 a.m. is 9 a.m. I get inspired every day at 9 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so talk us through the books. Like, this is Living the Next Chapter, so we're here to talk authorship and everything. So yeah, take yeah. us through book number one a little bit more, a little more detail. Well, I'm going to do this. If, if it's okay, I'm going to oh, yeah. it's right, right behind me here. Of course, so they're there. I'm going to grab these. And so, so the first book is called Black Belt Leadership, Beautiful. Uh, Seven Keys to Creating a Life of Purpose by Discovering Your Inner Champion. So this book came about, uh, again, when I was testing for my uh, seventh degree black belt, and my instructor has a requirement of writing an essay about how martial arts impacted my life. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, what are the C, the key seven components since I was testing for my seventh degree black belt? What are the key components that I've used to kind of, uh, you know, move my life ahead? So they, I came up with having a purposeful vision for what I wanted to achieve, being the change that I wanted. So embodying the change before it ever happened. Um, then next after that was, Having living with integrity, which is basically doing what I said I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, being in integrity with myself. Right. Number four is conscious persistence, moving through obstacles in a conscious way. Uh, number five is compassionate service. So basically taking our gifts and making sure that what we're doing is we're serving others. And that's what brings us the success is being service focused. Number five was acceptance and surrender. And surrender being not giving up, but give, or not giving in, but giving up the things that don't serve us anymore, particularly what's going on in our head. And then finally, taking inspired action. So it's one thing to do, have all these great thoughts, but martial arts is an action philosophy. So what are we going to do to make that happen? So 
that is the essence of my keynote talk that I give nationally. And sometimes I'll, I'll go into all seven, sometimes just a couple of those, as well as my online programs and my book. And so it really basically is my credo for how I look to live my life are those seven basic key principles. Well, there's so much there to soak in. I love this. This, this is this is definitely one of those must get books. I love this. So what about the second one? then? So the second yes. book is called Breaking Through. Three Winning Strategies to Create Breakthrough Results in Your Life, Business, and Relationships. And this came as a result of the Board Breaking Experience Workshop. Okay. So what happened, Dave, is I would, I've done several of these in Denver. So often I will run into people who have taken my Board Breaking Experience. And I was running into a bunch of people and it, the conversation almost always went the same. It was Chris, I love the board breaking experience. It was such an amazing thing for me. In fact, that board is still in my office. I look at it every day mm. and I'm, I'm, I'm flattered. Thank you very much. I'm humbled that you had that experience. And then my next question would be, how are you doing on the breakthrough? And half of the time they would say, oh, I got it. I did this and I did that. And the other half of the time it was like, well, you know, I'm still working on it. And it realized that even though I gave them this epic experience that was a launching pad, many of them didn't have the practical tools of how to get to breakthrough. Okay. So that's what this book is. I, okay. I take them on how to clarify their vision and then how to create their plan. And then finally, how to take consistent action so that they it can happen in their life. So that is really, it's a great partner for the board breaking experience. And that's one of the things, again, going back to my son in Taekwondo was, it's one thing to go to class and go through and have your class. But if you don't reference it during the week when you're not at class, you're not going to learn. It's, it's empty. As, right. It's empty. Right. It's, it's exercise. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with exercise, but exercise, physical movement, I believe with meaning, that's something that continues to inspire us. And as I said at the beginning, lasts a lifetime. Because even though if they're not kicking and punching, they still remember, oh, I've got this obstacle in front of me. This is how I'm going to deal with it. Right. Um, you know, one of the things we do in our in our students that test for the black belt is they have to do a number of physical things, as I'm sure your son did. But in the four weeks prior to that, they have to do. 4,000 push-ups and 4,000 crunches and spar 120 rounds. Mm -hmm. And it's all documented. But the other thing they have to do from a personal development standpoint in those four months leading up is they have to do 400 random acts of kindness. that wow. are all. And I, I misspoke a little bit. The kids only have to do 300, but they have to do 100 home chores. So Dave, of course, parents love me, right? Oh, yeah. They, they have to mentor someone <laughs> for 10 sessions. Nice. You have to eat clean for an entire week. So no, no sugar, no processed foods, no alcohol. Getting 10 year olds off beer is tough, but yeah, that happened. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then yeah. the final thing that I love is they have to spend a day either being blind, deaf, mute, or in a wheelchair for an entire 24 hour period. Really? So that they learn the power of empathy. So again, martial arts is the platform. But it's designed to help them grow into outstanding human beings. That's powerful. That's powerful. I just wow. I'm I'm I love how well rounded the approach is. It's not just one element, right? You're you're touching on so many different things with that. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay, so Chris. Who would benefit from purchasing this book, either one of these books? Is there somebody that would be your target audience for this? Yeah. In my coaching work, I do a lot of work with adults, uh, adult men, uh, particularly those that are I, – I tend to do well with people that have – Maybe in, you know, they've gone through their years, they've had their families, they're in that place, and now they're looking for what's next in their life. Sometimes they're people that are working in the corporate arena. Sometimes they're people that are business owners. I've done both, so I relate well to them. I also, you know, and I know this might sound from a marketing standpoint a little bit, off, I also love connecting with young people. And I think Black Belt Leadership for also kids, particularly that are in high school, is a great book for them. That, you know, if they're looking at, they, they've got a lot going on in their lives, as we all know, 
those teenagers do and to maybe give them a little bit of a basis uh, for how they can use those tools to move through life. We talked a little bit about um, the power of your voice. Mm-hmm. And I know that was one thing for my shy son that he really had to climb that hill to to use that voice. And he wouldn't be, he wasn't loud enough and they would let him know. And uh, he learned that very quickly. I love that you touched on that, but can we just develop that just a little bit more about how powerful the voice is? Because mm-hmm. I, as a parent sitting there watching my son do, do his poom says and everything and watching him and, and he just quiet little, eh, 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 and they're like, no, nope, no, 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 no. Louder. Right. And there, and you could sense the power that would come with your voice. I'd love to well, kind of open that up a little bit. Well, I'll tell you what, if, if I, if I may indulge you, I'd like to share a personal story on that with my son, my youngest son. So my youngest son, Jason, who is now, he's going to be 34 in, <laughs> in a couple of months, but when he was born uh, and, and as young as an infant, he developed a lot of ear infections. And so what ended up happening is he was growing into infanthood and toddlerhood, et cetera. Those ear infections delayed his speech. Mm-hmm. And so as a result of that, as now as he goes into primary school, and middle school and high school, he he was able to you know regain his hearing. He was absolutely fine. But that delay actually caused a uh, a disfluency in his speech. So he had a really bad stuttering problem for years. And he worked at the martial arts studio for me, but he would never teach because he was afraid of being on the floor and embarrassed. So he would just stay at the front desk. And he was getting ready to test for an advanced rank in his third degree black belt. And he and two other teenagers now, now Jason is 16, 17, 16, 17, and he's getting ready for this test. And one of the requirements for the test was for him to do a um, a creative form or creative pumse, right, to music. That was mm-hmm. one of the requirements at that advanced rank. And I noticed as he was training that he wasn't putting anything together. So about two weeks before that test, he came to me and he said, Dad, you know, I've been thinking about this creative form. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I know I could do that. But you know what really would challenge me is if I had to give a speech. So my heart stopped, Dave. I mean, as my mm. as father, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, we're going to have 300 people attesting and he's going to be out and he's going to stutter. And he's but the martial arts instructor in me said, this is exactly what he needs to do. Mm. So the day of the test comes. And he and his two compatriots are doing great. And now it's time for him to give the speech. And I handed the microphone from the judge's table and my heart's pounding. And he gets in in front of those 300 people, Dave, and he gives a speech with no stutter. Wow. And after that, his stuttering almost went away. And now he's teaching kids at the school. Well, fast forward four years later, he I'm at his college graduation in the auditorium, and he's been chosen by all of his classmates to deliver the commencement speech, which he delivers with no stutter. Mm. And now... He is a he's a he he has his master's in film. He has his own film company called Stories to Light, where his mission is to help people find their own voice. So if you think I'm a proponent of finding your voice, Mm -hmm. that's it, because it it's not only all the multiples of students I've seen, but my own son went through it. And that it's one of my favorite daddy moments of all time. If you can, you know, you can imagine that. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> what a, I'm so glad we went down that path. That's a, an amazing story. That Thank is you. so life-changing. Um, Chris, I would love for you to talk directly to the audience that are listening. I have a combination of authors and readers that are here today with us listening to our conversation. And I would just kind of love to leave them with some encouragement on the things that they need to break through in life and where to find the courage to do so. Can you kind of sum up for us and give us something that we can kind of put into practice this week? Absolutely. Well, I'm going to I'm going to take it, Dave, from from the standpoint of, of authorship, because going through the process twice myself and I actually have another book that I'm 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 working on. I have several much of it completed. It was one of the more challenging things that I ever did. I knew that I had a message that I wanted to share. 
but it was so challenging. And when I got down to it, what I realized is I was gonna gonna be allowing myself to be vulnerable. You know, it's one thing to say something. I'm on this podcast and I say it, a couple of people listen to it, whatever, hopefully a lot do for yeah. your for our purpose, right? But then it goes away. But man, when I write it, yeah, it's permanent. Yeah. And I remember even in the early days when I would hand them black belt leadership. I'd sign it, you know, I'd be given a speech, I'd sign it, give it to him. And there was part of me going, I'm glad you bought it, but you don't have to read it, <laughs> right? <laughs> because I was, there was an embarrassment of it. But I guess what I would say to everybody is the reason that you are being um, encouraged inside of yourself to write that book is because you truly, truly have a message to share. And I believe each and every one of us have that. And we don't understand the gift that our books can be. If even if, I mean, there's nothing more gratifying than me going and speaking and maybe I do a return engagement and somebody says, you know what? Last time I was here, I bought your book and I read it and I loved X, Y, Z. It helped me with this. If we just help one individual with our writing, it's worth it, right? Yeah. So if you're sitting there going, oh, I don't know if I have something to share. I don't know if it's that important. I'll just leave you with this. My my co One of my coaches told me years ago, he said, Chris, the things you think are ordinary, other people may think are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, we have a responsibility to share our message. So that's what I'll leave you with. It's beautiful. Chris, this is amazing. Um, for people that want to reach out, Chris, they, they're interested in having you as a speaker. They're interested in talking to you about your books. Um, maybe they just want to break a piece of wood. Um, what is the best way, Chris, to find you? Where are you most active? Best way to reach me, Dave, is through my website. It's my name. So www.chrisnatsky.com, and I'll spell that. It's C-H-R-I-S, all one word. N is a Navy, A-T, Z is in zebra, K-E.com. www.chrisnatsky.com. And you'll see all the programs that I have available. There's a way to reach out to me if you've got questions. You can also, there's several of my blogs that are up there for them to read and would love to connect with anyone in the audience if there's any way I can help or serve them. Beautiful, Chris. Thank you for making time for us. I feel like I need to go and, and do some exercise or run some <laughs> laps or something. I feel really inspired talking to you, Chris. Right. It's great to have you here on the podcast. Thanks, my friend. It's been my honor. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for subscribing and following. And you're listening this far in the podcast, so you are my best friend. I'm sorry, but you are now my best friend. So welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, LivingTheNextChapter.com has a link on the website to our Facebook group. Are you on Facebook? Probably. Uh, you can go there and you can actually interact with our guests. You can talk to them. You can see more about their journey, about their books. You can speak to them directly. You don't need me. You can come right over to livingthenextchapter.com. Click on our Facebook link to our community. You can talk to other listeners of the podcast from around the world who are on Facebook. And, again, speak with our guests. Don't you want to speak to the guests you just heard from? Yeah, you can do that on Living the Next Chapter. Go over there. There's links to our Facebook group, and you're welcome to join. Thanks for listening. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.